So greetings and welcome to today's educational program, Strategic Reflections on King Kano's Attractive Quality by Dr. Gregory Watson. This is your moderator, Doug Wood, with ASQ's Quality Management Division. So today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Dr. Gregory H. Watson. I want to please have you join me in welcoming him. Dr. Watson has degrees in management, law, and industrial engineering. He's an 18-year ASQ fellow and past chair, year 2000. He received the ASQ Distinguished Service Medal, plus the Lancaster, Crosby, and Ishikawa Medals. He's been named an honorary member by 17 national quality associations. And Dr. Watson delivered speeches to more than 20 ASQ national and divisional conferences, twice for the Quality Management Division. A former quality executive with Hewlett Packard, Compaq Computer, and Xerox, he's coached executives in quality transformations at Nokia Mobile Phones, Toshiba, ExxonMobil, and over 20 other companies. He's the only Westerner to be awarded a Deming Medal by the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, the W. Edwards Deming Award for Dissemination and Promotion Overseas. And so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Watson. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Doug. Well, it's going to be kind of a fun little journey tonight. We're going to talk about Dr. Noriaki Kano's model of attractive quality or his theory of attractive quality. And in particular, we're going to focus on strategic reflections relative to that. And, and uh, this is a picture of Dr. Kano. It's probably about uh, 15 years old. He doesn't look like that anymore. Uh, he was born seven years before me, or eight years before me, uh, seven and a half, actually. And um, he came up with his theory in 1984. And he basically, his idea is that attractive quality anticipates latent unspoken needs of customers. And that's really what's, what's behind the theory. And he says quality activity can only begin if top management is conscious of the critical need for organization-wide commitment to quality and its own responsibility for introducing such activity. And then he said, improving all attributes of quality or quality characteristics will not lead to satisfied customers as not all attributes are equal in their eyes. Some quality attributes will increase value to customers because they are attractive and they do not detract even when their physical fulfillment is not strong. And that's the essence of his statement of, of the theory of attractive quality. Now he goes into uh, a, a much longer discussion in the original article. And what I want to do is to go through in this presentation some of the practical and strategic aspects of his theory of attractive quality. So first we'll talk about the origins of the theory of attractive quality. Where did he get the idea from and how did it develop? Second, we'll talk about the basic principles. What is in the Kano model? How does it operate? And then third, we'll talk about how do we expand from the Kano model as most people understand it into the area of strategic thinking and applications. And, and this is, I think, one of the, the, the uh, more important things for us to, to pick up in this presentation. Many of you will have heard different pieces of the first two sections, but maybe not the third. And what I'm going to try to do in these first two sections is also give you the source references uh, from Japanese or, or other uh, publications that have driven these interpretations. So if you want to understand where they came from, you can do that research. So origins of the theory. Well, Kano began this whole idea of thinking about quality based on the work of Aristotle. And in this paper, he begins by talking about Aristotle's metaphysics, which was 330 uh, years before the Christian era. And in that, uh, Aristotle identified four different ways to think about what quality was. And so he says it's the differences between real subjects, what we would call quality characteristics. You know, is one characteristic better than another? We make a judgment. He says it's also a mode of a subject in motion of itself, ways in which a subject works that can be classified according to its value. So, so qualities are different ways that things operate. Then he also said it's good. The Greek word here is, is arete. And it's a, a characteristic mode that is desirable. And finally, it's bad, something that's inferior, a characteristic mode that is not desirable. And, and Kano used this Aristotelian definition to establish a juxtaposition between goodness and badness in his mental model 
for thinking of what were the quality characteristics. And so in 1976, he got a paper, Degrees of Badness, uh, which, which was where he first was expressing this kind of idea. There's also in, in, in quality sort of a sense of dualism uh, or philosophical dualism. And, and it comes about from Rene Descartes, who was a, a, a rationalist, and, and uh, John Locke, who was coming out of more of the empiricist tradition. And what we see is Descartes was the, this French nationalist, and he was the one who talked about Je pense donc je suis in his meditations on the first philosophy. And, and he talked about that there's two ways of comprehending. One is a learned idea or an innate idea. The learned idea is something you pick up from nature. The innate idea is what's in you. And, and the innate idea uh, was something that you could be pursuing to find a first cause. And this is what Aristotle calls a final cause, and today we call a root cause. And this came out of, of uh, Descartes' Meditations on the First Philosophy, 1641. John Locke, a Scottish empiricist, just 40 years later, is talking in his essay on human understanding. And he said, quality is the power to produce ideas in people's minds. It's the quality of the subject in which uh, this power exists. So he distinguished between between primary and secondary characteristics of objects. So primary quality is inseparable from the object. It is the object, and it is how you think of that thing. So that's the quality characteristic that is, is manifest. The secondary quality characteristic is produced by an interaction with the senses regarding that primary quality. In other words, it's how you perceive it. And so that might be, if you will, it's, it's not manifest, it's, it's latent, it's something that comes out based on how you feel about what it is you're seeing. Then we also start seeing there are some industrial applications of quality. Walter Schuhart, in his Economic Control of Quality, he talked about quality having two aspects. One was an objective reality, and the other was a subjective reality. And the objective is, is not influenced by any human interpretation. So it's what's happening in what he called the actual entity, quoting Alfred North Whitehead from his book, Process and Reality, and the subject of reality, which is, relates to the thinking, feeling, or discerning relative to that object of reality. So it's this subjective idea of quality that Schuhart uses to talk about the goodness of a thing. And he applied that to the outcome that's been fashioned to understand how do we perceive that thing to be able to fit its purpose. In 1939, Schuhart, uh, his, his second book, which was actually edited by Dr. Deming, uh, it was called A Statistical Method from a Viewpoint of Quality Control. He linked backward analysis of quality data to the design of quality products in the future. He said hindsight supplements foresight. So looking backwards supplements how we look forward. A view backward often adds materially to a view forward. So if we understand history, we can understand what we need to do in the future. So he's linking these, this dualism and saying that we can learn from those things. And we also start seeing that, that there were some, some ideas that contributed to this from, from Karu Ishikawa and Yoshio Kondo. So, so Ishikawa in his book, What is Total Quality Control, described a difference between backward-looking quality and forward-looking quality very similar to what, what uh, uh, Schuart had said. So these are the two distinct modes. The first is on removing problems, and the second is looking at how do we create positive value in the future by differentiating our products from, from those of rivals. Uh, for Ishikawa, the most important judge of quality is the customer. And so for him, all judgments had to be made by the customer, and that superseded the conceptual designer or the engineer who was creating something. And this was, I, I think, a very big contribution that came out of the Japanese quality movement in the early 1950s. Before then, it was the engineer designer, uh, the person who's writing the, the, the drawings, if you will, or doing the draftsmanships. That was the person who designed the value. But for, 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 for Ishikawa, value is judged through the eyes of the customer in that final analysis. And this was one of the major shifts that was happening with total quality control. Yoshio Kondo in 1989 in a book on human motivation, he started linking customer satisfaction to human motivation. And he defined motivation as stimulating the enthusiasm 
for somebody to engage in an activity or to do something. And, and so we're starting to st see that there is a, a, a blending now because uh, Khan, uh, Noriaki Kano was a student of Kuru Ishikawa. He, he was a discipline, a uh, disciple of Ishikawa. And he was a little bit behind Yoshio Kondo in, in, in working. So I think there was about a seven or eight year difference between them. So he would pay respect to Kondo and what he had to say. So we also see that another influence that came on Dr. Kano was the Japanese ways of thinking. So in, in Japan, there's actually two different ways to describe kinshitsu. Kinshitsu is a word for, for quality. So one is called atari, uh, atari mei hinshitsu, and that means that a product is fit for a function, and so it can do its its intended purpose. I have a pen; the pen writes. That is fit for function, and this is what Kano called must be quality. And then he had a another Japanese word that that modified hinshitsu, and it's miryo kuteki hinshitsu. And you have to forgive my, my pronunciation. Sometimes I stumble with these, but mir yoku teki hinshitsu. And this refers to what is called the charm of quality. And it measures intangibles like appearance, sound, touch. It, it's what gives personality to the product. And, and it's something that fascinates people. It's worthy of attraction, or as Dr. Kano likes to say, it's fit for love. So it extends well beyond the immediate product characteristics and how we interact with that. So it's got an aesthetic quality to it. So whereas the, the pen will write, the question is, is it, is it pleasing to hold? Does the ink look good to the reader? And, and those are characteristics that Kano called attractive quality. And in 1984, before he wrote his famous paper, he wrote this other paper, Miroko Teki Hinshitsu and out of, out of that's out of my in Shih Tzu. It's one o'clock in the morning, so my Japanese falls out very bad after midnight. So, so this was in this paper. He was starting to talk about these influences, which were the cultural influences on his model, and then there was a psychological influence on the model. And this was Frederick Hertzberg. It had nothing to do with Maslow. Uh, many people say, well, Maslow hierarchy of need. No, Maslow had nothing to do with the model. What it was was Hertzberg's hygiene motivation theory. And, and, and what Tano said is backward looking qualities like hygiene factors. These are neutral or dissatisfiers. They don't contribute to positive value. And then the motivators are what's contributing to forward looking quality or the attractive quality. And this is what needs to be <clears throat> designed into the products. So again, Maslow had, had nothing to do with this. So Kano called the marketing features or engineering features must be, that was the backward looking, and the forward looking he called attractive quality. And it's this attractive quality that creates the deep affection of a customer for a product or a service that builds brand reputation, uh, this attractiveness that distinguishes over time. And it's the sort of thing I, I always think about uh, the, the way people feel about their Apple. You know, they, they say, I'm in the Apple ecosystem. Everything has to operate. It all has to be Apple. Um, so that's the beginning part. Those were all the influences that, that were behind Kano when he created the model. So let's think about the basic principles. So this is the model picture as, as it should be seen. Uh, many times the pictures of the model show this attractive quality going vertically or must be quality going uh, horizontally, but actually they are should be converging because engineering converges as you get to this degree of fulfillment. So degree of fulfillment is the x-axis, the y-axis is customer satisfaction, and there are three functions, attractive quality, one-dimensional, and must be quality. And so when we start taking a look at this, we see that the, the two axes, the x-y coordinates, this talks about the degree to which a customer is satisfied from dissatisfied at the bottom, neutral in the middle, to highly satisfied at the top. The horizontal line is the degree to which the design fills the customer requirement. So very poorly to the left, neutral in the center, and highly to the right. The three functions that are defined are must be quality, which is the hygiene or minimal requirement, 
One dimensional quality is a requirement that customers use to make a value based decision about will I buy or engage with this product. An attractive quality is the motivator that says, I have to have this product. And so this again came in 1984, attractive quality and must be quality. And in the Japanese uh, Society for Quality Control, uh, their uh, Henshitsu is the journal name. So as we take a look at these three functions, we see must be quality is this characteristic that signs the essentials. And, and so this is expected, implicit, or basic uh, functionality of a product. Customers expect this to be consistently met. Dissatisfaction is increased if it's not met, but there is no gain in satisfaction if it is. So requirements like this are dissatisfiers, not delivering uh, satisfaction. And, and, and uh, they could also be satisficers. They deliver a compromise in performance that doesn't fully meet the promise. And so the desired outcome is minimal cost, without any extra capability as that doesn't influence people to purchase. So per performance creates a negative response and that then drives people away because this is a fundamental component. These are what Conro calls unspoken requirements. And as I was commenting uh, with, with Doug before we began, uh, this is very similar like uh, when you're buying a car and, and you don't think about these things, but it's very important that the car starts, stops, steers, and so those remain unspoken. I don't put those at the top of my list when I'm going to buy a car. It has to do these things. And so we start looking at, at these, which are the primary functions of the car. We assume that they will be embedded in that car. So, so when we, we say this requirement is unspoken because it's so well known, everybody expects it to be there. And, and so that's what, what one component of this must be quality is. People don't talk about it. And so we start t talking about this, and, and David Garvin in 1984 and 87 and 88 was writing uh, about his eight dimensions of quality, and he came out with these, these eight dimensions, and he says, we compete on these. We compete on performance, features, reliability, conformance uh, to meet standards, uh, durability, serviceability, aesthetics, perceived quality, and that's the, the, the range of competition that's happening between products. And what we start seeing is that, that we take a look at the design, and design determines how quality characteristics are fit into a product. So we have all of these characteristics as inputs to the design function, and then what we do with them will determine what is it going to be. Will it be attractive quality, one-dimensional, or must be quality? And, and so what Kano was actually getting at is saying, we have to pay attention to the design function, and there or one of the most important ingredients or applications actually of the Kano model is in design as we're thinking, if we have a quality characteristics, a feature or a marketing feature or engineering function we're gonna put into a product, how should it be presented to the customer? As must be quality, uh, we, we invest very little in it, just what they have to have. One dimensional, it has to be better than the competition or attractive quality, it's no competition, but we have to do what motivates the person. And so we see that, that the model is actually taking these things and saying, okay, each of those dimensions is gonna have a different value in terms of the customer perception. So kind of made the comment, improving all attributes of quality will not lead to satisfied customers as not all attributes are equal in their eyes. So the customer is the judge and we have to understand what is important to the customer. So we come to the second function now, one-dimensional quality. And what we see here is that one-dimensional quality is this normal competitive, it, it's manifest or explicit requirement. And these are like on a request for purchase, the checklist items. You know, we have to go and say, what are we doing here? And, and we call this because they, they focus on one dimension of performance at a time. So if we're buying a computer, Maybe we care about how much memory it has, or maybe we care about how fast it is running a particular program, uh, or how compatible it is with software. Each of those is a one-dimensional component of quality. We can make the comparison. Now, these requirements are indeed spoken because customers basically say, this is what I want. Now, they don't understand the, the basic functions that they may have because they're so well-known. But these, they understand that we can actually get some variety in the 
different competing projects. So, so if we, we have different uh, uh, producers or different models and so forth, we can choose different things and each will have a different price point. So here we're con competing on a combination of performance and value or price. Now, the third component is attractive quality. And attractive quality is the characteristic that indicates a market leading strategy. And here we see attractive quality, it, it's an undiscovered something. We're anticipating the customer latent needs. The customer may not even be aware of them. So as an engineer, I know I have a new technology. The customer has no idea what it is. But if I fashion that technology properly, I can give this customer a wow experience. I can excite them. I can motivate them. So this can build competitive value because it's creating excitement, if you will, in the customer's purchasing process. This is also unspoken. And it's unspoken because the customers have no idea how to use a technology that they don't really even understand. So this is a case where the design function is actually developing insight based on an imaginative understanding of the customer needs on what will give them competitive advantage. So this is a very important thing when we go into a marketplace to, to make us a, a winner in that marketplace. And we start seeing though, if we have this model, that over time, entropy exists. So what we see is entropy is the law that says basically over time, everything degrades to a lower state of energy. And so what was attractive quality over time degrades down so it must be quality. And, and the law of entropy affects uh, competitive forces and, forces and markets. It combines to assure this continuing degradation of in, uh, innovation in, in the features of, of quality and the, the design of quality. I remember in 1984, the Ford Taurus came out and the headline was, it even was a coffee cup holder. The next two years, guess what? Nobody in the automotive industry wanted Ford Taurus to be the only one with a coffee cup holder. So they started the design wars to create new coffee cup holders. And that moved it from attractive quality to one dimensional. And then just a couple of years after that, a friend of mine went to buy a car and he bought a car model higher because the one he really wanted didn't have a coffee cup holder. And that meant it went down to the must be quality level. And so something as simple as that can actually make a distinction in how you create an emotional response of consumers and how they're going to react with the product. And so we start seeing the, the, the art of quality lies in choosing a design. So it's an intimate understanding of the customer needs. That's what breeds this creative insight. And, and the way that we think about this is we start with the customer requirements. And we say, I, the customer, I have to know who that customer is. I have to know what their role is. What I want something. What do I want? What do I want to get done? So that what is this value, either business or personal value, I'm going to get out of it. And so if we don't define the role, then we don't know uh, who to check with or how to determine. So we have to understand what is the customer point of view. And if we don't understand the, the business or personal value, then we have an understanding a desire that is not grounded in a deliverable related to the customer's experience. And if we don't understand the, the or operationalize the functional capability of the words of the customer, the voice of the customer, then we don't have an aligned measurement capability to evaluate the output that's been delivered. So the customer experience must be measured by comparing expectation or desire from an outcome with the customer's own perception of that quality characteristic that's delivered. Now, when we start talking about understanding attractive quality, we start seeing that some dimensions of quality will create greater motivations in buyers. And so we start seeing there are things like utility, capability, aesthetics, innovation, accessibility, portability, esteem, and reliability. All of these can be seen as features of attractive quality as well when we start taking a look at what will give us that advantage. And we can start looking at products in a different way using dimensions of attractive quality. Now, we come to the third component of what we're going to be talking about tonight, and this is extending this theory into strategy. And, and so we, we have the basic fundamentals. I'm not going to have time to, to go into all of the, the practical applications of how we use this in engineering design although I will give you some references about that at the end. 
And I, I want to take uh, a, a perspective from Matsu Basho. I know I've used his quote before. It's one of my favorites. But do not seek to follow in the footsteps of the old masters. Seek instead what those masters sought. What was Kano trying to get at? Well, we see that back in 1987, a study that had actually been going on for almost 15 years at that point in time, it was done by competing business units, originally funded by General Motors at the Wharton Graduate School that then went to another company called Strategic Planning Institute, which was doing it. And, and, and Bradley Gale and, and Robert Buzzle wrote about that in the PIMS Profit Impact of Market Strategy Principles. And, and what they uh, observed was that we, we take a look at the outcome of the purchase decision. That gives you relative market share. We take a look at the performance judgment made by the customers, and that's relative quality between competitive products. And we take a look and we start seeing that when I look at both of those scales, when they're both maximum, we have the highest return on investment. The chapter in this book, I believe it was chapter six, was titled The Customer is King. This was one of the things that created, along with the Baldridge Award ISO 9000 Six Sigma in 1987, was a tremendous year for quality because a lot of ideas came out and, and people started saying, how do we deal with those? And, and so this particular component deals with this strategy and how we actually can create a strategic process. So let's think about how we can understand then strategic positioning or how to compete. So what are the challenges that face a product designer? And, and so we can start saying that we have to understand what it takes for a product or service to be suitable. We have the capacity to provide the full range of functionality for the features or, or of the product or service to perform. We have to go beyond functionality to incorporate aesthetics, like style and form, in a way that delights the customers. We have to be able to think creatively and generate innovation to make products or services unique, often by leveraging technology in new ways that haven't been done before. We have to improve accessibility and ease of use of the product service, make it more user-friendly, and enhance the way that people interface with it. We also have to make it possible for products or services to be used in a wider variety of applications and ensure that the product service is durable and will perform reliably in all of its intended environments. And finally, we have to bring esteem to the customers who will use the product or service because it's recognized and respected brand. And so these are all components of what we have to do. And when we start taking a look at this, how do I position that for my organization relative to the rivals or the competitors. And, and Michael Tracy and Fred Wirsama in 1995 came out with a book called The Discipline of Market Leaders. And in that book, they talked about uh, what are the core competencies of an organization. And they said there are three what they called value disciplines. So one is product leadership. We win because we keep bringing out innovative product features better than anybody else. So our competence is about research and productization or commercialization of that research. Customer intimacy is another. And they said this value discipline is that we understand custom solutions because we understand the customer's problems better and therefore we can create exactly the solution that they're looking for and that it's better than any other capability they can find in the market and it's good to meet their critical needs. And finally, a very familiar word to many people, operations excellence. And that says, we have a commodity product, and, and what we have to do is deliver low-cost, highly efficient goods and services without perceivable flaws in any of their performance characteristics. So how do those values relate to quality performance? Well, if we start talking about them, we see here are those definitions, and I know that I've, I, I talk relatively fast in these sessions because I'm panicking usually when I get through. But what I've done is in these, these PowerPoint slides, I'm giving the text that describes each of those uh, following the graphics. So you'll be able to follow what I'm saying here. So how do we map the strategy into the Kano model? So we start seeing we have uh, product leadership is basically a requirement for uniqueness in features. That's about this attractive quality. Requirement for feature differentiation is about customer intimacy. And that's this one-dimensional quality. And the requirement for feature flawlessness is operations excellence. 
And as we start seeing that we can map these strategic disciplines to the Kano model. Now the lower left-hand quadrant is not a winning quadrant. So we don't want a strategy to be down there. So, so we have to ask ourselves, what is gonna be the way we choose to compete as an organization in our new product development processes? So as we start seeing that, we start saying each of these lines in the Kano model, we could be re renaming them. So this bottom line is about compliance quality. We must have to do that. This other one is improvement. I have to be better than somebody else or I used to be. And the final one is about excellence quality. We are striving for superior performance beyond what others do. And again, the words are here. We also see these lines are differentiated quality. That's what really this excellence is all about or attractive quality. You see the difference. Nobody else is there. This middle line is really about competitive quality. This is where we're fighting a battle against other rivals and we have to be better. And that bottom line, which we were talking about compliance is important, that's really about commodity quality. It says that, that we are fighting a battle here where price is the dominant thing and any errors we have, any problems we have, if it's basically not flawless, you know, we lose the marketplace based on that. So we're, we're just basically competing in that operations excellence domain on price and quality. And again, we have the definitions of these here. So how do we understand then strategic positioning and, and developing competitive advantage? Well, the problem is we have dynamic environments. Everything is changing. New technologies are changing. The competition keeps coming out with new products. And all of these shifts are happening all the time. And if we want to maintain our competitiveness, that means we have to be very, very flexible or agile in how we respond and get ahead of those things that are happening in the marketplace. So how do we do that? Well, as product life cycles change, organizations manage more than one product. And we start seeing that I'm gonna have different products maybe on each of those curves in the Kano model. And then we dynamically change pricing based on which curve those products are on or which country we put those products to because they're more matched to particular economies. So it becomes clear that, that we must be competitive in all these market disciplines. We can't just choose product leadership or uh, customer intimacy or operations excellence. We have to have all of them. So agility in managing becomes a core competence. If we want to remain in a leader, we have to have flexibility in management. And that has to be uh, supplemented by collaboration to work across functions because sometimes R&D have to make the product for basic needs. Sometimes for customer intimacy, a benchmark against a competitor. And sometimes it's gonna be, you know, the sky is the limit. So all three of these have to affect how we make improvements happen in our products. And what that means is that, that we see that for attractive quality, one of our jobs is we have to stimulate innovation. We have to find ways to get people to think about innovativeness. And this is where methodologies like TRIZ comes into place. Now TRIZ is basically a structured brainstorming against scientific principles. So we have principles and we ask how can we apply those principles in this design. Customer insight comes from the fact, can we know our customer better than the competition knows our customers? Can we know the customer's job better then the competition knows their job. And because we have that insight, can we actually deliver something that is considered to be superior than the rival offerings? And at the baseline, I, I call this competence development because I think of this as in our organization, these are the fundamentals of our daily management system. We have to be able to deliver at this level to make sure that we guard band performance so we do not break down into the fourth quarter uh, that, that non-competitive box uh, at the bottom left of the Kano quadrants, because what we have to do is we have to preserve the quality, reliability, and operations, and make sure that it's the total life cycle cost that is operating in terms of what the customer is looking for. So as in each of these terms, uh, again, I'm defining them here and giving you a textual description. So you can go back and study them some more, okay? And so then what does it take to compete? 
And, and, and what I see is that the Kano model gives us a unique way for us to look at ourselves. And, and what we start seeing is this must be quality. Our strategy here needs to be to strengthen our organization's quality competence. How do we protect ourselves from, from messing up operations excellence? How do we keep ourselves from having failure events that are significant in terms of customer perception or reliability events that let the customer down? When it comes to one dimensional, we have to increase customer insight to build brand reputation. Because if we have a problem in this area, brand reputation will save us. It, as long as the customer knows they can trust in us to fix the problems. But if we have a bad brand reputation, that doesn't save us. It undercuts what our condition is in the competitive environment. And we also have to design innovative quality systems and methods. And that's what the quality, attractive quality is all about. And as we look at this, we start seeing that means we have to have what I call inclusive quality. So it's involving everyone, engaging all people at every level to fulfill their unique responsibility to deliver quality outcomes. Oops, haven't we called that total quality for some almost 40 years now? And as we look at this, we start seeing what are the crucial ingredients to drive this? So, so the imperative is, is we have to manage critical assumptions in these areas. So we have to build value into the customer experience. And that means the critical to quality things, those are must be quality. So if you come from a Six Sigma perspective and you think about CPQs, those are the must be items. Those should map one to one. When we think about this one dimensional quality, that's what we mean by critical to satisfaction because this is where the customer is actually knowing that they're satisfied or not. They've been able to say, this is what I want, that's my belief, my expectation, and this is what I got, that's my perception. And expectation and relative to perception, that is what satisfaction is. And finally, we see critical to motivation. So this is saying, hey, I have the hot app. I have, I have the uh, uh, runaway product, something that's really something that everybody wants to have. As we start seeing that, we, we can take a look and use these factors to judge what's going on. Well, we're coming to the end, but not quite the end, because I actually have a quiz for you. I'm not going to give you the answers this time. You have to come back to the next session to get the answers, okay? But I have 10 questions, and I'm just going to slowly walk through them now and see in your mind, can you answer the 10 questions on the Kano model? So the first is, under which of the three quality characteristics would you most likely list the features of a killer app or a hot product? Got it? Do attractive quality and one dimensional quality coverage, uh, or do they convert, converge rather, or do they diverge as they approach engineering excellence? So how do those curves actually work? Will attractive quality always be superior as the decision-making criteria to the other two quality functions? What quality functions will a customer most likely describe as being important to their purchase decision? Which quality characteristics are most likely to be ignored when a voice of the customer survey is conducted? Do one-dimensional quality and must-be quality converge or do they diverge as they approach engineering failure? Where does irre irrelevant quality appear in the Kano model? Hmm. What identifies an, irrele an irre irrelevant quality function in Kano's model? What is the meaning of reverse quality in Kano's model? And how do these three quality functions relate to design strategy? There's some things I didn't talk about there. And, and Doug and I were talking before the event happened, and there are some things in Kano's model that are not usually talked about, like irrelevant quality or reverse quality. And, and so I want you to start thinking, do you really understand everything that's in the model, or do you just have a surface knowledge? Have you figured out how you want to apply this in different dimensions? 
or, or, or do you only know that that's the picture, that's a Kano model? So there's some critical takeaway observations. So strategic insight aids management in doing things differently in the future. And gaining perspective on, on what to do and what can be done requires deep reflection into the nature and meanings of all relationships in a business. So the Kano model or theory of attractive quality provides an exceptional window for us to understand how organizations can learn to become competitive and maintain their competitiveness. So we've addressed three things in the webinar. First of all, understanding the theory behind the Kano model. Where did it come from? What were all of the sources of ideas going through Dr. Kano's mind as he put the theory together? Second, we talked about the three major components of the theory, not that it's complete, there's irrelevant quality and also reverse quality, which we haven't talked about. But we've talked about the major considerations and how they can change as we take different perspectives. And then we've talked about some of the strategic implications about how do we actually design our product portfolio? How do we manage this in different elements, in different ways with the Kano model as a way for us to think about things we could be doing differently in terms of creating an attractive environment for our customers and building, if you will, long-term brand reputation. Because remember, customer satisfaction is event-driven. Brand reputation is the, uh, uh, the confluence of all of those customer satisfaction events on what people then make a judgment on what they can count on over the long period of time. So. Doug, that's going to be the, the end of the uh, discussion. We have at least 10 minutes, I think. Uh, yes, 10 minutes now, so for some questions and answers. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we, we do have a couple of questions here. Earlier on, Joseph asked the question, so which companies have demonstrated attractive quality? I guess he's looking for, you know, examples where this may have been done in, uh, you know, popular ideas. Do you have any? Well, I think iPhone certainly did when it came out. Uh, I, I think that as you get more and more competitive, now what we see is Samsung and, and Apple are competing not on attractive quality anymore, but one-dimensional. Um, and, and I think as you start taking a look at new industries coming out, entrepreneurial organizations, very often the newness to the market creates that attractive quality. Uh, for instance, uh, the Prius, when it came out, it was the first electric car. That made it attractive. You know, not that it was attractive in an esteem sense, but it was attractive in an engineering sense. And if you cared about it in the environment, it was definitely attractive because it didn't pollute, uh, or at least to the same degree as anything else. Um, there's a company here in Finland that has renewable fuels, so they make fuel out of animal fat and things that would normally be considered garbage, and they turn that into biofuels. And, and those biofuels have less carbon content, and many people find that to be attractive. So, so many of the models uh, of leading companies are things that are attractive, if you will. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will always stay attractive. As the life cycle of the product goes on, they will move down to one-dimensional or even must be quality. Okay, great. Uh, so another one, and this one, this one's a little tongue in cheek. Uh, Andrew asks, so is traditional must be quality really the unspoken taken for granted quality? And, and market and designers are right. What is really important is attractive quality and the product must work, must just must work right. The marketing mind is right. Form beats function. So is that, Kind of what we're seeing here? Well, you know, I, I remember when my son bought his first car, and, and he was just happy that it functioned. You know, he'd get up in a winter morning in Virginia, and if it started, he would be saying, hallelujah. <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah, if you're designing a new product, marketing people will try to make all the pizzazz work and, and get all of the attractiveness in it. But if it does, doesn't perform its basic function. You know, people don't like it. I have a beautiful pen. It's actually cost a lot of money. It was a gift to me. I never would have bought it. It had holographic features on it and everything else. 
but I still haven't figured out how to actually load the ink in it. And so is it a pen or is it a piece of art? It's a piece of art. And, 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 and it sits in a cabinet and it gets dusted. I never actually use it. I have another pen and I actually got it in Toyota <laughs> and I carry it with me everywhere I go because the darn thing keeps working and, and, and I can get the refills anywhere. So, so, you know, if you start taking a look at these things, attractive quality may not attract forever. It may be like fashion. It, it can turn over relatively quickly. But if you have a form, if you will, that, that must be quality is form, uh, attractive quality is fashion. That's a distinction that the person's making the question. But if the form does not deliver what it needs to, uh, then uh, uh, it's not going to be useful. There's a in Finland. There's a very famous architect. His name is Alvar Aalto, and, and he basically says that if in, in his one quote on quality that I've ever found, he says that in design, if you don't have quality, then the whole design is senseless. So, so if you don't have the functionality there, no matter what it's looking like or, or whatever, then it's not working. And, and so this is, I think, uh, one of the things we have to think about. You have to blend form and function together. And, and that's what I think the final lesson is. Okay. Uh, so here, here's one from Daniel. He says, what guidance does Con uh, Kano give on prioritizing quality characteristics that are normally, that are potentially conflicting, like ease of use versus extended functionality? Well, I, I think what, what Kano does, and if you get into this in his article, what, what he does is he, he starts saying, there are a number of times that you will take a look at this. And what he actually does in that article is he provides a, a tool for making judgments based on how customers feel about things. Um, I, I didn't go into this, but his, his development of this model was basically around uh, a, a project done for, uh, uh, his name was uh, uh, Takanori Yoneyama, the, the, he became the chairman of Konica Minolta, but he was a quality manager, and they were trying to design electronic cameras. And he wanted to understand is, what are the different distinctions in cameras? And so what they did was, the very first thing they did was they studied the photographs and said, what are the reasons people don't take good pictures? And that's how then they sequenced in what they were going to deal with. And, and so um, as he's, he's looking at, you know, how are we going to actually develop quality in the future? This became a structured approach for how, how they will do that design. I, I think I'm missing, I didn't quite answer everything in that question. I got off track. Can you repeat the question again, Doug? Yeah, what, what guidance does uh, Kano give on uh, prioritizing yeah, Kano, sorry. Okay. Uh, on prioritizing quality characteristics yeah. that are potentially conflicting, like ease yeah. of use versus extended functionality. Yeah, so so if you take a look at, at his original paper uh, and you take a look at there, you can actually create a survey uh, to find out how customers feel about those three things and then use the actual customer dimensions in that survey to make some judgments. And this is more of the application of the Kano model in a design functional or an R&D project. Um, that is actually perhaps the least usage that I see of the, the, the model. Um, quite frankly, I don't see many people doing that, uh, and they should. Uh, one of the things I recommend uh, in, in people developing a, a customer matrix, if you will, or pre-QFD type of analysis, is identify for each feature or uh, marketing feature, engineering function, which curve is it actually addressing? Is it addressing an attractive quality curve, a must-be quality curve, or is it a one-dimensional quality curve? And that can help them, uh, them structure then some idea how much attention it deserves in their engineering development process. Okay. Uh, yeah. Getting a lot of questions here. We may not get to all of your questions, okay? So what you have on the screen right now, you have Dr. Watson's email address. And uh, if, if you want to send him an email, you may do so after the talk. And your email that comes later on after this talk, you'll have his address as well. 
so I mean, make one more comment about that. If yeah. you do send me an email and you request the slides, there is a bonus. And in that bonus is the methodology I just referred to, how to use this for um, uh, calculating the different types of effects that are in products. So I think there's about seven articles that I've, I've packaged together and I'm gonna share, uh, share them with you as a bonus uh, if you ask for copies of the articles. Okay, yeah, so you know, you, if you're really interested in this, you need to get that. Uh, okay, so uh, we, we have time, I think, for just about one more. Um, so uh, let's see. Here's a. Good, I think this is a good one. Uh, Denholm asks, uh, how would this apply when the organization has a monopoly? Ah, interesting. So the way it applies when the organization has a monopoly is that you use this to structure how to cannibalize your old products. In other words, when you have a monopoly, you're your own competitor. So you get to decide at what rate do you replace your products in the field and how do you manage them. So, so there, there's less uh, hassle about doing it and you can actually go about doing that much more easily. Uh, so, for instance, uh, when I was at HP, we basically owned the printer market with the inkjet printers and laser jet printers, and, and we could decide when were we going to launch new products. So, so uh, at one point in time, we'd actually co-designed PaintJet and PaintJet XL, which became known as DeskJet. And so PaintJet was launched in 1987, but HP did not launch uh, the DeskJet. Uh, until 1991 uh, in response to Compaq Computer trying to get into that market. And Compaq came out with two inkjet printers and two laser printers. In that year, HP launched 29 products and totally <laughs> overwhelmed them. And then a Compaq said, we give up, we can't do that. It took us four years to get these four products out. And Compaq gave up in the marketplace. And HP still basically owned that marketplace until some Japanese firms came in to compete. And I think that's the question that you have. When you have a near monopoly, you choose what you introduce, when you introduce, what's your motivation behind it. As long as you want to say we're the product leaders, you can lead whatever pace you want to. Okay. Uh I, I, I do think we're, we're out of time. I'm sorry for the lack of getting to everybody's questions. Uh, but I want to, again, th thank you all for attending. Um, so we want to do a few closing items. Again, if there are more questions, uh, you know, email them to Dr. Watson, and he will answer that. If you ask for the slides, he will provide them, uh, and also that additional material he talked about. Uh, you'll receive an email in about 24 hours indicating your 0.1 RUs earned for this event. Also, the email will have this uh, Dr. Watson's email address. So uh, here are our upcoming webinars. I want to make sure you understand these are coming. Dr. Watson indicated he will answer his quiz uh, on September 29th in our uh, number 10. <clears throat> uh, then he's doing uh, one in October and one in November. We have some other webinars coming up here. We have uh, part three of our four-part how to use my ASQ. Uh, Susan Gorvet is going to talk about that. Now notice that's 3 p.m. Eastern time, not 6 p.m. as we normally do these things. Uh, QMD part four will be how to create content and that's at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And then we have one more uh, in, in November, uh, strategic planning and Hoshin uh, from uh, uh, <laughs> JD Mahivko and Eric Zink. Uh, so that that's upcoming. Um, we, we want to make sure that, you know, you know to join ASQ. If you're not a member of ASQ, uh, ASQ is what brings you these kinds of things, this kind of material. You can't get this elsewhere. Uh, it's definitely a high value to belong to ASQ. Uh, also, if you're a member of ASQ, we'd like you to uh, check out my ASQ. Uh, and, and my ASQ actually has, uh, you know, discussion boards and things. You'll find Dr. Watson and others, uh, you know, writing there, uh, answering questions. Uh, th these are significantly more in-depth discussions than you will find in other bulletin board areas. Uh, so, uh, 
make sure to visit the My ASQ communities uh, and follow us there. So uh, it's time to end our program. I want to thank you, Dr. Watson, and I want to thank each and every one of you for participating. So with that, uh, goodbye for today, and we will see you again uh, on, on another day coming up soon next month. So thank you.